like a lot of the speakers here tonight, I think I began my journey not really having much idea where I was going to end up. Uh, that was me <laughs> entering college. Uh, when I got to college my first couple years, my main distinction was I set the dorm record for the most number of lockouts ever in a single semester. At the time, I had zero interest in teaching. I didn't really think about um, doing something like working in astronomy. But by chance, uh, a professor uh, offered me a job to work for a summer at an observatory, uh, looking at studying star formation regions like the one shown here. And a few months after that, I decided to try applying to graduate school in astronomy. And at graduate school, I had my first experience or ex first exposure um, to teaching while teaching as a teaching assistant. And um, from graduate school, I spent much of a decade after that just doing pure research. Um, but I decided to come back to doing a mixture of teaching and research um, by taking a chance to join the faculty at College of Charleston. And I think one thing that's amazing about uh, doing teaching and research at the same time, when you're doing research, often we focus on very, very narrow ideas or very narrow topics. Um, this star here I observed over and over again for the, the better half, the better part of a decade. And this is a, often an effective way to crack a problem. But in teaching in the classroom, you have to take a step back from that and think for a minute about how do all these things come together? What are the sum of the parts? And what are the meaning of it when you bring it all together? And for me, that's an amazing thing about doing teaching and research at the same time. Um, and it's something that I wish that all scientists could have the experience of doing. Uh, but being at a liberal arts college um, with a focus on teaching um, doesn't mean that you can't do world-class research. In 2009, I led a team of researchers uh, and we discovered a cold planet-like object shown here around a nearby sun-like star. Uh, and this ended up being, after being published, uh, was featured in Time Magazine's top 10 scientific discoveries of 2009. And at College of Charleston, um, in addition to doing research myself, a lot of what I do is mentor um, student researchers. And uh, two of my student researchers are here tonight, and these are two students who discovered a planet of their own, one that's about 13 and a half times the size of our own solar system's Jupiter. And uh, please join me in welcoming soon-to-be graduates from the College of Charleston class of 2013, Laura Stevens and Thea Kazakis. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Thea Kazakis and I'm from Lebanon, New Jersey, <laughs> and I'm Laura Stevens and I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. So, something that Laura and I have in common is that we're both super excited about the fact that there may be other intelligent life, other places in the universe. So I don't know how many people know this, but there are actually more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches on the entire planet. So the chances of those stars having plants around them that could sustain life is really, 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 really high. So because of that, Laura and I both became interested in exoplanets, because that is where the life would be. <laughs> So um, we're going to talk to you guys tonight about um, the planet that we found. It's called Cap Andromeda B. And hold on. Yeah, there it is. It's right there. Look at him. Oh. Um, so we're calling him Derek, and you should also call him Derek. It's a good name. <laughs> so when I meet students, other astronomy and physics students from other colleges throughout the nation, they always ask, why did you go to the College of Charleston? Because it's a small liberal arts school. It doesn't have graduate programs in either physics or astronomy. So I say, because it's better that way. Because if you go somewhere with a graduate program in either physics or astronomy, the graduate students are always going to come first. They're always going to get the best research project, and they're always going to get the most attention. 
But here at the College of Charleston, it's all undergraduate, so we get all the attention and we get great research projects. So because of this, we were able to have this great opportunity to work on directly imaging exoplanets with Dr. Carson. Um, so to do this, we looked at about 30 different stars that we thought could have planets. Um, we used the Subaru telescope, which is in Hawaii, and that's it. Um, Subaru is the Japanese word for the Pleiades. This has nothing to do with the cars. So this is actually a really nice picture. I really like it because it, um, that like denser cluster of stars up there, that's the Pleiades. So you have like Subaru and Subaru, and it's nice. So basically what we do is we get a whole bunch of pictures from this telescope and we just uh, look at them with computers. The computers look at them mostly for us and then we, is there a planet there? And then if there is, we get really excited about it. So that is how we found Derek. Um, <laughs> so Derek is about 13 Jupiter masses. So we're calling him a super Jupiter because he's quite a bit larger than Jupiter. Um, he's a gas giant. Uh, he is about 170 light years away. And... Um, He's the most, uh, no, Cap Andromeda, the star that Derek is around, is the most massive star known to have a planet, so that's a pretty neat superlative. So something special about this planet and the one that Dr. Carson found is that they are directly imaged. Yes, oh man, thank you for saying that because I was supposed to say that and I forgot. <laughs> So yeah, that's actually a really neat way to find planets, and it's a really like hard way to find planets. Only 12 planets have been found with direct imaging. All other methods of exoplanet detection are indirect, so we look at the effects of the planet on its star, but we're really just looking at the star. But this one, we actually get to see, like, oh man, look, right there, there's a planet. That's it, right there. So it's a pretty cool thing to do. <laughs> So because Laura and I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Carson and do this research, so along with the pride and glory of finding a planet, we also have a high-end publication in the Astrophysical Journal right out of undergraduate. So um, we're graduating in a month, and we're both very sad about it. Um, yes. Next year, I'm going to start pursuing um, an astronomy PhD at Cornell University. <laughs> Thank you. I'm terrified. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to teach high school, which is also terrifying, but in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> so, one last thing before we stop jabbering at you. Um, the most important accomplishment that we've succeeded in is there has been a Canadian brewery that has named a beer after Derek. <laughs> so... <laughs> So it's called Super Jupiter, and it is grapefruit-flavored beer. So um, my family called the brewery and actually got some shipped to my house in New Jersey, and apparently it is not disgusting. But um, <laughs> So yeah, not many people can say that as an undergraduate, they had a Canadian beer named after a plant that they discovered. So go College of Charleston. Thank you for listening to us. Yeah.